Good evening and welcome to our event this evening. We're so happy to have you with us, whether that be in person or whether that's through our live stream. I'm Judith Figu. I am the Director for Advanced Studies and Academic Excellence with Pinellas County Schools and with me this evening. Hi, I'm Hannah Graziano, also with Advanced Studies for Pinellas County Schools. We are here tonight to talk to you a little bit about how advanced coursework will help your student leverage the opportunities that we have in Pinellas County Schools to benefit them through the college admissions and financial savings processes. <laughs> oh, one too many. So to get us started with the conversation, I think it's really important to just kind of have a sense of where, where things were as it relates to college admissions and where things are at today in, in costs so that you can be thinking about how what you're doing throughout the high school experience is going to benefit you post high school. So you'll see on the screen that we've got a few um, data points that might be of interest to you. If you look at the span of time from 1995 to 2015, in our country, the inflation rate over the course of that 20-year period was 55.1%. But if you take a closer look and you look at the private national universities, the tuition rate at those private national universities increased by 179% during that same span of time. The tuition rate at out-of-state public universities increased by 226% during that 20-year period and the in-state public universities increased by 296% during that same time period. So while inflation has been held at 55.1% over those 20 years, the expense of going to college has far surpassed and outpaced the inflation rates. And so as we think about getting our kids through high school and onto their next steps, we need to be thinking about how we're gonna make sure that they are equipped to make that as cost effective as possible. And what you can see is that even though the, um, the in-state university tuition rates have, have had the greatest rate of inflation, they still remain, until financial packages are put out to kids, they still remain the most cost-effective option for our students. Bright Futures is one of the mechanisms that our students can use in order to help offset their, their expenses for tuition and for college. And Bright Futures is a scholarship option for students in the state of Florida. And basically, it's dependent upon a couple of different things. One is the student's weighted GPA in a very specific set of courses. And those courses are the core courses that are needed for university admissions. So that's four English classes, four math classes, three natural science classes, three social science classes, and two world language classes. The Bright Futures requirements recalculate GPAs based on their own weighting system. And so that way, whether a student is in Pinellas County or in some other county in the state, it doesn't matter how we weight grades because we want everybody to be on an equal playing field for the scholarship opportunity. So they recalculate a GPA and when they do that, advanced placement courses, dual enrollment courses, um, IB courses, ACE courses, those all are recalculated with a 0.5 weight. So an A in an English 1 honors class would be worth a 4.0, but an A in an AP language class would be worth a 4.5. So when it comes to recalculating those GPAs, if students are going to perform similarly, then taking those accelerated courses are a real advantage for them. The second piece to Bright Futures um, eligibility is test scores and those test scores can be ACT scores or SAT scores and you can see the current numbers up there um, in order to get the highest level of Bright Futures scholarship right now which is the academic scholarship a student would have to get a 29 for their um, for their total score on ACT or a 1290 for their total score on SAT and for the medallion scholarship, which is one step below that, it would be a 26 on the ACT or an 1170 on the SAT. And then you can see that the third component of whether or not a student is eligible for a Bright Future scholarship is the community service hours. 
In order to qualify for that top scholarship that reimburses 100% of the tuition, a student has to complete 100 service hours. And in order to um, acquire that medallion scholarship, it's 75 hours. So again, it's a combination of weighted GPA, recalculated by the Bright Futures, college entrance exams, and service hours. And so the Bright Futures Scholarship is a great opportunity for students, but they need to be thinking ahead and making sure that they're performing well in their coursework so that they're going to be eligible for this down the road. The second thing to be thinking about in the college admissions process is understanding just how competitive college has gotten. I graduated from my bachelor's program in 1994, so the landscape has changed dramatically since I graduated from college. It wasn't nearly as competitive as it is for our kids today, and within the state of Florida, in the most popular schools that we have, whether it be University of Florida or Florida State University, you can see, based on what's on the screen, that it's very competitive to get into our state university system schools, the most popular and most competitive ones. The information that is on this table that's in front of you is taken from something called the SUS matrix. SUS stands for State University System, and that's a matrix that's published every year, and it's available on um, the DOE website. If you just Google SUS Matrix 2018, you'll be able to find the full document that lists all of the different state universities and has a plethora of information about those universities. Everything from the three most popular majors for undergraduate students, to average SAT and ACT scores for the kids that are entering their school, um, to what their tuition fees are, what their room rates are, and all of that information so that you can compare the state university schools side by side and get a snapshot during that comparison of whether or not that's a school that your child is going to be on target for being eligible to. But the snapshot of data that, I, that I've provided on this slide includes Florida State University, the University of Central Florida, the University of Florida, and the University of South Florida. And you can see that in that top row, the percent of applicants accepted, students can apply to enter in the summer term, or they can apply to enter in the fall term. And when you look across that row, you're going to see that there is a greater percentage of students accepted into the summer semester for their starting term than there is for the fall semester. That means the fall semester is a more competitive admittance process. There is a much larger pool of applicants for the, for the fall semester start date. And so it's just something for a student to be thinking about. If you're right on that edge of maybe hitting the scores that the school wants or hitting the GPA that the school wants, it might be to your benefit to go ahead and apply for, for the summer semester, and that way you're, you're giving yourself a leg up in the admissions process. You can also see the mid-range accepted GPA. So that's the middle, um, the, if you look at all of the students that entered this fall and you, and you look at the middle section of them, what was their GPA range? And that is recalculated again by the college so that it puts all students on a, an even footing regardless of where they're coming from. You can also see the mid-range SAT scores for that middle group and the mid-range ACT scores for that middle group. And the numbers that are up there are definitely very competitive numbers. These are not, these are not slouch institutions, and it is becoming harder and harder to get into them, and therefore more and more important that as our students are selecting courses for their upcoming school year, that they're thinking about how are they going to make themselves competitive in this process, right? But without overdoing it, because sometimes our kids think that they have to do a full schedule of AP courses or a full schedule of college-level coursework. And, so, and that would be more than what a full-time college student does. And so thinking of strategically about what you're taking, which is part of what Hannah's going to do most of her conversation about, is really critical and important for our students. Pinellas County Schools is making a commitment to our students, our high-level students, to make sure that we can get them all of the things that they can possibly need out of their high school education. That includes offering them the SAT suite of assessments, which begins in the eighth grade with PSAT 8-9. When our students move on to ninth grade and 10th grade and 11th grade, they have an opportunity to take the PSAT NMSQT, National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test. It's their 11th grade year where taking that test actually could qualify them for National Merit. 
And then in the 11th and 12th grade, students have an opportunity to take an SAT. All of these pieces are at no cost to our families. We want to provide the best opportunities for our students to gain admittance into the universities of their choice. And as a result, we recognize the importance of making sure that students have the chance to understand where they are starting out in the eighth grade and see how much they're growing over the course of time and prepare specifically for that college entrance portion uh, or meaning for the SAT. Our second strong commitment to high achieving students is our Elevating Excellence Initiative. I know some people in the audience were able to join us last week for a presentation about Elevating Excellence. That's a program that we've established and we've sent invitations for. Those invitations were based on students having a 3.0 or better unweighted GPA, along with qualifying benchmarks for the PSAT math and the PSAT English and writing portion. So if students were on track for college ready with both of those pieces, and they had a 3.0 unweighted GPA, then they were invited to participate in Elevating Excellence, which is a year-round program. Starts with a summer seminar, and then there are some, also some activities during the school year, which we spent a lot of time talking about last week. So if you were invited to that and you didn't have a chance to join us, that, um, that recording will be live as well as this recording on our website. Elevating Excellence was um, invited, we invited students who are presently in the 9th, 10th, and 11th grade. Um, E-Counselor is another um, initiative that we've started in our district. E-Counselor gives parents and students an opportunity to reach out to a guidance counselor after hours. So if you have some questions that the school counselor wasn't able to answer or, or that your child wasn't able to get to the school counselor to ask because of other commitments, then you can also reach out to get an answer through e-counselor at pcsb.org. So after tonight's presentation, when you go home, if you have some lingering questions that we haven't been able to answer or that you thought about after the fact, that's a great place to go ahead and shoot an email, either that or your child's school counselor so that you can get some detailed information. AVID is another commitment that we make to college admissions support in our district and Hannah's gonna talk at length about the AVID elective. And then of course, college level courses that we offer in our Pinellas County High Schools. There is a very wide and broad range of college level classes that we offer and we're going to review those options as well this evening. Because again, our goal here is for you to walk away understanding how you can take the advanced and accelerated courses in Pinellas County Schools and use those to your advantage to leverage for your college admissions process. When it comes to university acceptance, the things that the colleges are gonna be looking at is essentially the student's resume, so to speak. So what have they done with their time? Are they committed to something very specific? Um, and along with that, what, what's on the transcript and what are those test scores? So those are the core pieces that colleges are gonna be reviewing when your child's making application to university. The types of things that they look for, when they're looking at the transcript, they're looking for what kinds of classes your child took are the, is the student taking honors classes? Is the student taking AP classes? Is the student taking dual enrollment classes? To what degree has the student challenged themselves? They're looking at what kinds of grades were earned in those courses. If a student is taking a straight schedule of honors classes and they're making all A's, the question for the college is gonna be why didn't they challenge themselves with something a little bit more rigorous like advanced placement or dual enrollment? If a student is taking a full schedule of or a, a largely full schedule of advanced placement and dual enrollment courses and they're getting A's and B's, that's very impressive in, in the mind of a college. If a student is taking one or two AP courses and they're getting B's in that, but they're taking other honors courses and getting A's and B's there, that's a great balance too. The key is not to overdo it. The key is to find what is that point of balance for, for you as a student or for your child and make sure that they're going to be as successful as they can taking the courses that they're taking, stretching themselves to the extent possible. They're also going to take a look at what your child earned on the ACT or SAT. They're going to be looking at the best combined scores. So if a student sits for the SAT three different times, they're going to find the best math score from those three SATs and the best evidence-based reading and writing score from those three SATs and they're going to put those together even if they weren't on the same day. They call that super scoring. And last but not least, it's gonna be what was the student involved in and did it show a commitment to something specific? They don't want a kid who is involved in 20 different things at the surface level. They wanna see that a student has really 
leaned into something and shown commitment to something. A great example would be um, I have a, a nephew who has spent a significant amount of time volunteering with specific types of organizations. And on top of that, he does a couple of activities at school. But most of his time is dedicated to those service-oriented pieces in a specific arena. It's not like it's two hours here and two hours there and five hours there and four hours over there. It's in a specific arena. It's showing dedication and commitment and passion towards something specific. And that might be, you know, if your child is, is really into soccer, that commitment could be the kind of time that they're investing in soccer and, and the investment that they make in being captain of the team and, and those types of things. But the idea is commitment to something specific. We would strongly recommend that a student takes full advantage of the opportunity to sit for the PSAT each fall from 8th grade through 11th grade. 8th grade is that baseline year. 9th and 10th, we're going to get to see how is that student growing. That student's going to be able to figure out how to use those scores as a means to get some personalized preparation so that they can score as high as possible in the 11th grade and potentially qualify for a National Merit Scholarship or other scholarship. Years ago, National Merit was the only scholarship associated with PSAT. At this point, the College Board has connected with numerous different organizations to create millions of dollars worth of scholarships based on PSAT. And when a student takes the PSAT, they check a little box that says Student Search Service, and then their data from the PSAT is shared with colleges so that colleges can reach out to a specific type of student in order to try to recruit them to their school because they fit the profile that the college is looking for. And that might be a score profile, it might be a gender attached to a specific, um, a specific major. It depends on where they've got some gaps at their school that they're trying to fill in. And then last but not least, um, I would again encourage you to take the time to find the 2018 SUS matrix online and review it. It's not something you're probably going to want to review on your phone because it's a long document. Um, but I would bring it up on the computer and take a very close look at it. I think you'll find a lot of useful information in there. So with all of that, Hannah? All right, if that wasn't enough. <laughs> Um, all right, so one of the biggest questions that we hear very often from students and parents is, so should I take more AP or should I take more dual enrollment? Which one is better? Which one do colleges want to see, right? And so I'm going to allow you to make those decisions based on some actual facts and just comparing the two. So you can see down at the bottom, this is a level playing field in terms of cost. Both programs, advanced placement, which is AP, and DE, which is what we refer to um, as dual enrollment, both of those are no cost to you as a family, okay? So now I'm gonna start over on the advanced placement side. Advanced placement is a national standardized curriculum across the entire country that is overseen by the college board. Now the college board is also who oversees all of those SAT suite of assessments, okay? So major organization designing curriculum that is standardized from the West Coast to the East Coast. So when you have a child sitting in AP Biology in the state of Florida, their colleagues all the way up in Michigan are sitting in the exact same course, getting to the exact same exposure of curriculum, and then sitting for the exact same exam in the end. So when colleges look at that and they see that a student took a particular AP class, they know exactly what that student was exposed to from a level of rigor and what kind of test taking skills they have and what knowledge they gained because they know every kid sat for that same test. Okay? The other big thing that AP has is that it is completely open access and that means that you have to have no qualifying scores. Um, no particular GPA. If you have an interest in that subject, you can take an advanced placement course if it is offered on your campus. Okay, so it's wide open. And then the other thing to know about AP is that it is only at the high school level. Right? It, is, it is taught by our high school instructors. They go to national training to get training for that curriculum, but it is our standard high school um, teachers on campus. And then the grade that they earn in that class is going to go on their high school transcript and therefore colleges can see that a particular student earned a B in AP Biology and that goes, gets averaged into their high school GPA, okay? 
So kind of just like taking any other class, like an honors class. This is a standard class, but it is considered college coursework. And that exam in the end can translate, depending on the, the score, can translate over to college credit. So the scoring is based on a one through five. If a student scores a three, four, or a five, a university will take those scores and translate them over into the equivalent college course on their campus, okay? So now let's switch over to dual enrollment. Dual enrollment, again, is at no cost to you, but rather than a national standardized curriculum, this is a locally defined curriculum. Our dual enrollment here in Pinellas County is an articulation agreement that we have with St. Petersburg College, okay? So that is taught by high school instructors who have gone through the credentialing of being essentially an adjunct professor on our high school campuses. So these are taught, again, by high school teachers, but who have credentialed in teaching this college-level course. From an access perspective, there's, it's a smaller access because students have to have a particular GPA and some um, qualifying test scores in order to take dual enrollment courses. But they again are offered at the high school. And it, if it's not offered at the high school, all of our Pinellas County students have the ability to go to a SPC location and also take a course there if they have those qualifying scores and that qualifying GPA, okay? What did I miss? Locally defined, yes. Um, so the top one is the biggest one, Judy talked to you a little bit about thinking through and intentionally taking those classes. I mentioned that your AP score just gets averaged in, or your AP grade gets averaged into your high school GPA. The same is true for dual enrollment. So if I get um, that B in maybe a composition class, that's dual enrollment. That gets averaged right into my high school GPA, but at that point, my college transcript has started as well, and that B also goes on my college transcript. So if after a couple years of high school, I've taken three or four dual enrollment courses, all of those courses have been averaged into my high school transcript GPA, but all of those courses are also sitting on a college transcript, and then when I apply to a university, they can see what my college transcript looks, at, looks like at that time. So that's something to consider when you're thinking about how a student is gonna do and how, how closely linked those classes are to their interest. Those are typically classes we would want students to perform really well in because it can impact two different GPAs. You had a question? Yes, and so, and so with dual enrollment, great question. So with dual enrollment, this also articulates into college credit just by passing the course. So if I get an A, B, or C in the course, that does translate automatically to that college credit. But it is a locally defined curriculum, right? So that means that SPC has the ability to, and we, SBC articulates with most of the state university systems, right? And so it's going to transfer over as you would expect. If I took a comp course here at SBC, I can take that with me up to UF. But if I decide that I'm going to go to UCLA, UCLA might not recognize that course as I took it. They might, and they might not. So right. I'm just going to add to, um, to, to clarify a little bit. When I take an AP course and I score that three, four, or five on the exam, mm -hmm. Colleges will decide what credit I'm going to get within the state university system that is very, um, very well defined because it's defined by the DOE. Outside of the state university system, it's, it's college by college, and you can look that up because there is, um, there's a look up on the College Board site that you can literally pull up the college that, that you're thinking about mm -hmm. and what the AP exam is and what the score is and what you're going to end up with credit in if you get that score. It does not equate to a grade going on the college transcript it equates to credits being added to the college transcript. So 
you have both options at all of our high school campuses, all of our traditional high school campuses. We offer a wide variety of AP courses that are all listed up there for you. I'm not going to read them all to you. But most of our schools offer somewhere between 18 to 24 AP courses in any particular year. Some of them alternate courses on and off and offer them every other year. But on, on any given time, you pretty much have access to 20 or so AP courses. And then again, all of our campuses do have dual enrollment. The variety ranges from campus to campus, but typically they have somewhere between three to six dual enrollment courses offered on the high school campus. And then you have also access to taking those courses at SPC campuses across the district. In order to be able to access dual enrollment, you have to have seven credits on your high school transcript that are in the four core content areas so that we can calculate your GPA based on a wide variety of subjects. So those four core content areas are math, science, English, and social studies. So it is not common for our ninth graders to take dual enrollment, but every once in a while we have a ninth grader who has already acquired those seven credits in math, science, English, and social studies. Typically, our, at the end of the ninth grade year, the kids are planning what their dual enrollment is going to look like and planning course progression. There is no, um, there's no GPA requirement for advanced placement, so students can start that as soon as they enter high school. Additional question? That's okay. That has to be, that has to be pre-approved at the school level through the school counselor. I don't know that there is an so, actual. Sorry, for the sake of the people who oh. are listening via live stream, we have to, we have to um, <laughs> repeat your question. And the question is, going back a couple slides, um, for the service hours for Bright Futures, do we have a list provided somewhere of, of what the service hour options are? Um, that's something that a student has to complete paperwork and their counselor has to approve. There is not a defined list, um, but there is information on our district webpage. If you go to the district webpage and you look at departments and you go to guidance, you'll be able to find some additional information about Bright Futures. So the question, the <laughs> follow-up question is, do middle school volunteer hours count? And the answer is a student has to be considered a ninth grader in order for those hours to start accruing. So the question is, do, is there a place online that you can find out what dual enrollment courses and AP courses are offered at a particular campus? At this point, probably most of our schools have their um, course guide for the next school year posted to their website. And within there, you can see what courses will be offered for the 2019-2020 school year. Because One like I said, that's often, sometimes that changes year to year depending on staffing right, because we have to credential teachers for dual enrollment, and sometimes we alternate science courses. So for, from year to year, that might not be consistent. Oh. Yes. Every high school has some dual enrollment courses taught at their school, yes. And we had one more question up here. All right, the question is, what schools are ACE courses available at. So we have Dixie Hollins High School offers the ACE program, Clearwater High School, and Tarpon Springs High School all have ACE. Mm -hmm. And so those are district application programs, and mm -hmm. students from anywhere in the county can apply to an ACE program, which one you apply to depends on where you live. But in addition to that, at those three schools, if I'm just a student who's zoned to Clearwater High School and I didn't apply to be part of the ACE program, I can access those ACE courses. I'm allowed to go ahead and take them even though I'm not an application program student there. Okay, so now that you know what course offerings are potentially 
happening at each high school around the district. We want you to start thinking about in that college planning process, and Judy planted some of these seeds earlier, but when you think about your course selection, we sort of want you to think all the way ahead to when you go to college, what might be the outcome of college? What do you think you're going to major in? And then do some research at some of the colleges that you're interested in and look at what that course progression looks like at the college campus. So if I want to major in engineering, and I think there's a, I've narrowed it down to a few schools, I'm going to go on those websites and I'm going to look at what courses do I need to end up with a degree in engineering. And then you can trace yourself backwards and sort of backwards plan what courses can I take in high school that will either knock off some of those classes off the list or they will prepare me for the course progression that I'm going to go forth in so that you can be prepared as much as you can be for those courses when you get there and be successful. So we don't just want you to just say, oh, this one, right? We want you to think very intentionally about those classes. And Judy said also trying to find the balance of how many that is that you can be successful in, right? If taking seven AP courses, because there's seven periods in a day, probably doesn't make sense for any of our students, right? Even kids on a college campus are not taking seven classes at any given time. So we want you to find that balance with what your interests are, what your potential majors are, where it is you think you might go, and then backwards plan from there what courses on our campuses match up with those, what programs around our district match up with your interest, and then go from there. Um, Judy mentioned earlier, um, there is, in our AP classrooms around the district, um, there is a credit by exam course equivalency poster, and it's also on each uh, college's and university's website, so that you can see, as you're sitting in AP chemistry, if I get a three on this exam, I know exactly what course and what credits that will equate to if I decide to go to the University of Florida. So this is something also worth looking up and seeing, all right, if I need to take this class, what do I have to get on that exam for this to count for the major that I intend to go forth in? And then, um, our college level courses, typically most of our AP courses and dual enrollment courses are going to transfer into three college credits. The exception there for some of them is our science courses that um, have a lab component. Sometimes you can earn that extra credit depending on the score that you get. You can get the extra lab component credit with that. All right, so Judy talked a little bit about some of these before. AVID is one of our commitments to helping students get on their way to college. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about what AVID is. Um, AVID is offered at every one of our secondary sites, so all of our traditional middle schools and high schools have AVID. So AVID is a program that, one, offers an elective course for students to sit in every day of the week that offers them some a skill set that they might not naturally come with that we know that they'll need in college. So it'll provide them some of those critical thinking skills. It'll provide them some organizational skills. It'll provide them um, how to, uh, some skills on how to collaborate with each other and how to work in a team and how to problem solve. And then there's some time management pieces thrown in there. And then along the way, along their progression through those four years, their teachers are talking to them about the college going process and how to apply. And by the time they're in their junior and senior year, we're walking them through how to complete their financial aid forms, how to access scholarships and what scholarships they're eligible for. We go as far as taking them on those college field trips to make sure that they get to go step foot on those campuses and see what it feels like to be on a smaller college versus one of those huge campuses and lets them kind of on their own decide what type of school is the best match for them. Along the way, AVID really is just a support system for students who want to access those rigorous courses and maybe they just haven't accessed all those rigorous courses before. So twice a week, they get to sit in a tutorial group with college tutors and they get to bring 
whatever work they want with them and whatever confusions they're having in any of their classes, they bring that to their, their peers and they bring that to their tutor and they work through those problems twice a week, every week for four years. And in some cases, seven years if they start in the sixth grade. So this is a great program for students who are thinking, I want to take those rigorous courses, right? Or parents, you're thinking, yeah, well, he might lose all his stuff, or you know, she's, she just doesn't have all those skills yet. AVID can help support that process and get them to college along the way. And then Capstone, you saw a few slides back, one of the um, courses that was listed up there that all 16 of our high schools have is AP Capstone. And AP Capstone is a, a sequence of courses, it's two courses that are very different from any other AP course that has ever been offered before. So, and Capstone came about because colleges came back to College Board and said, you have, you're sending us all these kids and they have a wealth of knowledge. They've all taken chemistry and they've taken language and they've taken Spanish and they've taken all these AP classes, but they get in their, their college courses and they don't know how to do a research paper and they don't know how to work within the team and they don't know how to present and they don't have all these skills that colleges were saying they're not going to make it through college without these skills. They have a wealth of knowledge, but they're lacking the skills. So College Board's answer to that was, well, let's create a course that's about skills and not content. And that's where AP Capstone came from. So if there's any two classes that I would ever take in high school, if you're thinking about AP, the, these would be the ones. So AP Seminar um, is a course where students get to work collaboratively in teams and do some research around topics that interest them. And their teacher is sort of just a guide in how do I research things? How do I validate a source and make sure that the information that I'm pulling is a, a valid source of information? How do I present that in a group? What's the best way for me to articulate my point in a concise way? How do I work within a team where one person seems like they're not doing any of the work and I'm doing all of the work? They learn all these skills in a group setting. And then by the second semester, they get to do that same thing, but more independent. They start to pull away from that group. They do more research, they do more presenting, but they're starting to make that group environment a little bit smaller. And then they take an exam, just like the other AP courses, at the end, a multiple choice exam, that they earn that one through five score on. The best part of this class is that's only one third of the overall exam score, is that multiple choice test. Because I just told you that first semester they do that presentation, that presentation actually counts as part of that exam grade at the end. And then when they do that presentation second semester, that also counts as part of that exam grade. So they don't have all of their eggs in that basket in May. Two thirds of that grade has already been recorded and done along the way. So very different from our other AP courses. So then when students leave AP seminar, the following year they would take a course called AP uh, research. And this is a place where they spend the entire year researching one thing that's of interest to them. It's essentially a doctoral dissertation at the high school level. They find something that interests them, and it could be something that was pulled from another AP course that they're taking, right? Or it could be just something that they have a, they have a high interest in. They figure out and design that research question. They do all the research. They actually conduct a study to present new findings about that particular subject and then they present it in front of a panel. That panel presentation is their final exam grade. There is no sit down multiple choice in this one. So again, all our eggs aren't in that one basket. There are steps along the way during the year that will count toward that final exam grade. And then there is no sit down on this day you take an exam. So very different from our other AP courses. 
At the end of those two courses, if students complete both of those courses and get a qualifying score of three or better, they will earn what we call a capstone certificate. We were talking at the very beginning of this presentation about how competitive college is and setting yourself apart and what will you do to set yourself apart. That AP capstone certificate is one thing that can set your student apart from others. Colleges are really recognizing, universities are recognizing how important these skills are to students graduating in four years. And that is every college's goal, is to get those kids on campus and back out in four years. So this is definitely a way for kids to set themselves apart from their peers, is completing these two courses. And the next step on top of that is something that we call a capstone diploma. So a capstone diploma is, again, taking both of those courses and earning your three or better in both of those courses and then taking any other four AP exams and getting qualifying scores three or better on all of those. So a total of six AP courses, two of those have to be those capstone courses. Earning that three or better will give them a capstone diploma. Right now, that capstone diploma in most colleges and universities' eyes is equivalent to an IB or ACE diploma. So they recognize the skill set and the knowledge base that students have if they are coming out with that diploma, that it also gives that, that competitive edge that a lot of our IB grads and our ACE graduates have. I never looked back, so I didn't, I want to make sure I covered it all. Um, the one Judy? thing I would mention yes. is that um, it's highly advised that the students take those capstone courses mm -hmm. in back-to-back -back years. Yes. And so students would take AP seminar followed by AP research either in the 10th and 11th grade sequence or in the 11th and 12th grade sequence. The advantage to doing 10th and 11th is that the student would know whether or not they had achieved at a minimum the AP capstone certificate by the time they're making application to college. But either way, students who are involved in the AP capstone program, if they are making application to a college that uses either the Common App or the Coalition App, which are online apps that serve a wide range of colleges, there is a box that they can check that says that they're a capstone student, just like there's a box for an IB student to check to say that they're an IB student. So it is something that is very much a presence for colleges when they're looking at that application. I see questions. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the question is, is AP Capstone offered at all of our high schools? And the answer is 16 high schools have the AP Capstone program. Um, Jacobson Technical is new to us this year, so they're just starting their array of AP courses, and I would imagine we will eventually have AP Capstone at Jacobson as well, but we do have it already at the other 16 high schools. Yes? The question is, what's the difference between middle school AVID and high school AVID? Um, I would like to say nothing. Um, it is just a continuation, but there is definitely more of a focus on that college-going atmosphere, right? So we are really focused on finding those scholarships that match to you and really finding the right university for you and getting you on those college campuses so that you can feel them out. And you do a little bit of that in middle school, but there is more of a focus on that part, and you're gonna be taking more and more rigorous courses in high school, right? You have the, the opportunity to take AP courses for four years, so we wanna make sure that that AVID is in, in your schedule so that we can support those courses. But fundamentally, there is no difference between middle, middle school and high school. When a st the question is, what were the S PSAT qualifying scores for being invited to Elevating Excellence? And it depends upon the grade level. I don't have the numbers memorized in my head, but when a student receives their PSAT score report, 
one of the things that's indicated is whether or not they are on the grade level benchmark for evidence-based reading and writing and whether or not they are on the grade level benchmark for math. And so the qualifying piece is that they are on track for both of those benchmarks. So the question is, when you take Spanish 1 and Spanish 2 in middle school, do you continue through that progression and take AP Spanish, or, do, or have you satisfied your requirements? From a university acceptance standpoint, the requirement, the minimum requirement to get into one of our state university schools is two years of a world language. And so a, a student who took Spanish 1 and Spanish 2 in middle school would have met that minimum requirement. But when we go back to talking about students being competitive in that college admissions process, I would always strongly recommend at least a third year of that language. Um, so I would recommend Spanish 3 in that case. Typically, students are taking AP Spanish after they've taken Spanish 4. So that would require a couple additional years if they wanted to continue with it. And that's really more around whether or not that's the child's area of interest or whether they would prefer to take some other elective once they get that third year out of the way. Yes, ma'am. Spanish 1, 2, 3, 4, and then AP if a student's going to progress through the AP level. Yes? Is there such thing as going to Spanish beginning and Spanish 1 in middle school? Or like, you don't have to So it has to, it, if you're taking a class in middle school, it has to be the high school version of the class in order to count toward the progression and in order to be on your high school transcript for colleges to see. So if you're going to take world language in middle school and you want it to count toward that piece, you need to take the high school Spanish 1 class as your first one, okay? We're going to hang around and answer whatever individual questions people might have, so feel free to come on up and ask questions. Otherwise, we very much appreciate that you took the time to come tonight, and you've got contact information for us as well. If you think of something after you've left here, you're certainly more than welcome to reach out to either of us with your questions. Thank you so much.